Hello! In this video, we are going to talk about using language. We will take a look at pragmatics, which explores aspects of meaning not predictable from the linguistic structure. This video is made by Group 2 from 19DB, which consists of Hairu Nisanurufira, Clara Siva Mutiara, and Nabila Puspita Dewi. There are several things that we are going to look into. Cooperative principle, speech act, remembered framework, discourse analysis, taking it in turns, repairs, and politeness. Let's start. First of all, I am going to define pragmatics. Pragmatics is the branch of linguistics that studies those aspects of meaning which cannot be captured by semantic theory. In brief, it deals with how speakers use language in ways which cannot be predicted from linguistic knowledge alone. In a narrow sense, it deals with how listeners arrive at the intended meaning of speakers. In its broader sense, it deals with the general principles followed by human beings when they communicate with one another. The Cooperative Principles An American philosopher named Paul Gries is regarded as the father of pragmatics. He highlighted that human beings communicate efficiently because of the natural tendency to help one another. Greece proposed four maxims, or rules of conversation. The first one is maxim of quantity. Give the right amount of information when you talk. The amount of information that you give in conversation must be appropriate enough to maintain a good conversation. The second one is maxim of quality. Be truthful. If someone asks you something, reply truthfully. Do not give a false reply. The third one is maxim of relevance. Be relevant. In a conversation, only give relevant reply. When someone asks you something, Give a reply which fits the question. The fourth one is maxim of manner. Be clear and orderly. For example, describe things in the order in which they occurred. The cooperative principle seems like a common sense, but interestingly, people often break it. Infringements of Greece's cooperative principle show how strongly it works because the listener assumes that a superficially uncooperative answer is in fact a cooperative one. The main problem with these Grecian maxims is that they are fairly vague and the conversational implicatures or conclusions which can be drawn are wide and numerous. Some recent work, therefore, has attempted to specify how humans manage to disentangle what is relevant from the mass of possible inferences they could make. Speech Act When a person utters a sequence of words, the speaker is often trying to achieve some effect with those words, an effect which might in some cases have been accomplished by an alternative action. A number of utterances behave somewhat like actions. If this line of reasoning is taken further, one could argue that all utterances are acts of some type. 
This overall approach is known as speech act theory. And it is another method by which philosophers and linguists have tried to classify the ways in which human use language. In this case, by treating it as parallel to other actions which humans perform. Proponents of speech act theory try, in the first place, to list the various possible speech acts which a speaker might attempt to perform. At the heart of the list come statements, questions, and commands. For example, I state that it's cold. I ask you, what's the time? I command you, go away. These are examples of direct speech acts. The act is expressed overtly by the most obvious linguistic means. But many speech acts are indirect in that they possess the synthetic structure more usually associated with another act. For example, go to bed. Isn't it past your bedtime? You should have been in bed long ago. All three of these sentences are intended as commands, but only the first has the typical command structure. The first is therefore a direct speech act, but the second two are indirect speech acts. The question is, how do people know which speech act is intended if each act can use the synthetic structure typically associated with one of the others? A possible answer is, to specify happiness condition or felicity conditions. If we could fully identify the felicity conditions for each type of speech act, then we would have moved some way towards understanding how humans use language. Hello, my name is Nabila Puspita Dewi. Now I want to explain about remembered frameworks and discourse analysis. Let's start with the first one, remembered frameworks. The field of artificial intelligence or AI has provided a further approach to how people understand one another. AI makes proposals about how to simulate intelligent systems on computers. The original problem was one of finding out how computers could be made to cope with inexplicit and superficially irrelevant conversations. This is an example of irrelevant conversation. A solution proposed for the computer might also be one utilized by humans. Knowledge, it was suggested, might be stored in the form of stereotypical situations or frames. So, a framework is a basic conceptional structure, as of ideas. These memorized frameworks are adapted to fit in with present reality, so they are altered as required. So, for example, a person might have a frame representing a typical kitchen, and would have slots in the frame for a sink, a cooker, a dishwasher, and so on. A superficially disjointed conversation, such as the one in the previous slide, would become quite coherent when considered in relation to the kitchen frame in a person's mind. Furthermore, the speakers in this conversation clearly have a certain amount of mutual knowledge, in that they both have a similar outline kitchen frame. Another way of dealing with human interaction, therefore, is to specify both the relevant frames and the mutual knowledge held in common by the participants. Now move to the second topic, discourse analysis. When we use language, both conversation and written texts have various devices for welding together miscellaneous utterances into a cohesive whole. 
These two versions are more or less the same as far as semantic content is concerned, and the syntax is fairly similar. Nevertheless, there is a lot of difference between the two. The second on the right is both stylistically better and more normal sounding. The first on the left appears to have been written sentence by sentence, without any attention to the overall effect. In the second, various devices have been used in order to link the sentences together into a cohesive whole. After its first occurrence, the word curry has been replaced by alternative words, this type of food, the dish, and by the pronoun it. Similarly, George has been replaced by he, and in some places, the order of words has been altered so as to maintain the smooth connections as when it was brought to the front of its clothes. In addition, some of the original sentences have been joined together. Discourse analysis is the study which deals with this topic. It overlaps with stylistics, the study of linguistics and literature. Devices which maintain the smooth flow of communication are particularly important in written language, where there is no one available to clarify unclear points. However, many of these devices are also used in ordinary conversation. Consider two versions of the same dialogue. The first version on the left sounds stilted and odd, even though by itself, each sentence is well formed. The second version sounds far more like an ordinary conversation. It contains devices similar to those used in the piece of prose about George and his curry. After the first occurrence of fright, the alternative phrase that man and the pronoun he have been used. The third sentence has been changed into the passive in order to keep Fred at the center of attention, and so on. The overall result is that the whole dialogue becomes linked together into a cohesive whole, something that people who know a language do automatically, though people learning a second language usually have to be taught this skill as the devices used vary in their details from language to language. Hello everyone, my name is Clara Siva Mutiara, and in this session, I would like to explain about three topics. They are taking it in turns, repairs, and politeness. The first topic is about taking it in turns. A turn is the time when a speaker is talking, and turn-taking is the skill of knowing when to start and finish a turn in a conversation. In this slide, we can see the example of mother and baby. This brief snatch of conversation illustrates one important fact about human speech. People take it in turns to talk. Even if one of the participants cannot speak, the other one pretends that the non-talker has taken their turn. Humans typically take it in turns to talk. This is known as turn-taking. It is an important organizational tool in spoken discourse. And in this slide, we can see another example when speaker A asking about something and the speaker B is answering their question. The second topic is about repairs. Conversations do not necessarily run smoothly. People cannot always explain things properly, or they make a mistake, or the person they are talking to makes a mistake. These minor breakdowns, if not teased, have to be repaired. So-called repairs can give additional insights into the way in which humans comprehend one another. This is the example of repairs that involve self-repairs and other repair. Self-repair is the situation when a speaker spontaneously notices a problem and solves it. Meanwhile, the, the repairs that involve other repairs is situations when someone is not quite sure about what has been said or suspects that the other person has made a mistake. However, humans do not usually comfort one another directly, 
so other initiated self repair is very common. Minor breakdowns in a conversation can be repaired either by self repair when speakers correct themselves or by other repair. And the last topic is about politeness. Humans tend to be polite to one another, so politeness can radically affect the structure of conversations. This politeness is based on two basic social requirements, no criticism and no interference. These requirements of no criticism and no interference have an effect on language. Any criticism or interference will be a social risk. Therefore, speakers have to balance up the advantage and disadvantage of straight talking. In here, we can see the example how to respond when we see our friends was drinking too much whiskey. We have three different options. And every different option has uh, advantage and disadvantage. Different cultures have their own ways of minimizing any offense if someone feels obliged to criticize or impose on another. Each culture has its own preferred strategies. This type of study therefore overlaps with sociolinguistic. That's all from us. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you can learn something from this video and see you next time.